Hi everyone, I'm Matt from the storage systems team at DigitalOcean. This is how we operate stuff at scale. There's a lot of content in these slides, so I'm basically going to be speed running it. Um, a quick run through of the agenda. I'll talk a little bit about what DO is, who we are on the storage systems team. Um, I'll move on to our use of Ceph at DO, how we approach our automation and what we use it for, which leads into operating clusters. I'll finish off with a little bit of reflection, not just with Ceph, but our approaches as well. And we'll wrap up with hopefully some time for a hiring plug and some Q&A. So what is DigitalOcean? We are a cloud provider founded in 2012 based on the core concept of simplicity. We started with the Droplet, a $5 SSD-backed virtual machine, which was very attractive in 2012. In 2016, we introduced the second product, which is Volumes, step back detachable droplet storage. Uh, since then, our product portfolio has grown significantly, including Spaces in 2017, which is our step back S3 compatible uh, object storage offering. Uh, along with DBAS, DOKS, App Platform, LBAS, and more, most recently uh, serverless functions and managed hosting with Cloudways. Uh, we have data centers in eight different regions, some with different metro choices, such as SFO 2 and 3, that give our customers more than a dozen choices to place their resources. We had an IPO in 2021, and now we get to join in on the stocks memes. Uh, Storsys is a small team of six engineers with a number of goals. The scale of a team and the scale of our deployment should not be tied together. There should never be a ratio of engineers to clusters when considering team size. Just because we have another end clusters over a year uh, doesn't mean we can hire new engineers to dedicate them to those clusters. A uh, huge help with that is we try to automate everything we possibly can as potently as possible. An end goal or dream, as it were here, is that we uh, never have to SSH into a node for day-to-day -day operations. At the same time, we're not going to let perfect be the enemy of progress. There's a lot of room for hacky uh, one-off bash scripts. Uh, eventually, the automation becomes complex enough that it makes more sense to promote it to a service. This is useful for things like network remediation or auto PG repair before Ceph did it for us, and even an entire disk replacement pipeline. So let's talk about Ceph at DO. Uh, Ceph use at DO is growing rapidly, uh, used for block and object storage, which powers both the volume and spaces uh, products at DO with many growing clusters. Other teams make heavy use of volumes and spaces for many of DO's other product offerings. Uh, so some quick stats about DO. These are the numbers I'm allowed to share. I can't go any further. Uh, 46 clusters in total, uh, 38 are production uh, from uh, they're running Nautilus and eight staging, some of which are Pacific. More than 140 petabytes of raw storage in Ceph. Our biggest clusters are over nine petabytes. Uh, this does not include the droplet backup, snapshot, or bring your own image storage, which is pretty staggering in itself. There's more than 23,000 OSDs in our fleet and 1,200 servers running. So I want to give a quick mention to as many parts of the automation as I can, including outside of our team. So a quick whirlwind is outlined here. There's a longish process of qualification and procurement that happens before we decide to deploy a set of equipment for a new generation of clusters. A lot of the stress testing is automated, though it's mostly through scripts and tooling that's run directly on the nodes. Uh, we do the same sort of thing when qualifying new drive models as well. So our data center ops do the rack and stack. They make cabling beautiful, power on all the equipment, hand it over to your network and hardware engineering teams. Networking team will then configure switches as appropriate. Uh, there's additional complexity here for the public facing load balancers and spaces clusters. For the hardware engineering team takes the server nodes through a provisioning workflow, and they're left with a base OS with up-to-date firmware on all components. Storage Systems then runs our version of provisioning workflow and populates Ceph cluster from scratch. I mentioned a bunch of automation that we use and some of the tools that we use are listed here. Chef is used for a lot of the core OS stuff, general config management. Uh, we use Ansible for things that are Ceph specific, such as deploying the cluster from scratch, augmenting the cluster with more nodes or drives. Uh, AWX is an open source self-hosted solution for running Ansible playbooks. With it, we can share failure modes with the team and we have a detailed history of runs. We still write one-off bash scripts from time to time where automation doesn't make sense. This is often due to us seeing it as a uh, one-off as we understand it at the time but we still fully document those with context and tickets because sometimes that stuff gets moved into a playbook. 
uh, again, don't let perfect be the enemy of progress. Something to note here, we don't use Ceph ADM at all today. It didn't exist when we started, and we haven't been convinced that we'll gain much benefit from it today. Because of some of the requirements for secrets management and other DO ecosystem ties, we can't use a typical off-the-shelf solution anyway. We've had to support Luminous, Nautilus, and Pacific. Upstream automation has changed between these. Uh, we require fine grain control over the cluster layout for our, and behavior for our specific needs. We are still keeping tabs on the options available, for example, uh, Rook, and we may evaluate them in the future. So the bulk of our automatic lies in Ansible deployments. Ultimately, this is what allows us to operate stuff at scale. Not particularly new or innovative, but it is cool to see a bunch of YAML turn a bunch of metal into user consumable storage. As mentioned previously, new cluster deployments and augments are done through these playbooks. Augments come in two forms, either adding disks or adding hosts. Uh, we handle both of them in a similar way by expecting or increasing a disk count on each node. Uh, node reboots will safely reboot any of the nodes that we need to, either when we want to on demand or whether we just need to for kernel updates or the likes. Uh, we set our nodes in central config up using the Ansible playbooks and reconfigure them at will. Uh, the Ceph upgrades are also done through these playbooks, and this is pretty easy because we use containerized deployments. We've been running Ceph for a very long time, and because of that, we've had some file store OSDs that we want to move to Blue Store. This could be done safely with our playbooks, either by draining an OSD and recreating it, or doing it dangerously by destroying and recreating in place. Uh, OSD restarts can be done one at a time or host at a time, and the playbook will just wait for the recovery to complete before, before moving on. Um, since we've been running these clusters for quite a while, eventually they get old and we need to shut them down. Uh, this kind of teardown is largely handled by the automation, but does not include getting the data off the cluster. Uh, some of the utilities and goodies that we use here uh, to make all the other stuff work uh, include roles like uh, Ceph Wait Healthy, which is possibly the widest used role in our, uh, in our repo at this point. It ensures that the cluster is in an expected state before continuing. Uh, determining health is super simple for a script and super boring for a person, so we let the script determine safety as appropriate. There are node maintenance up and node maintenance down uh, roles that safely pull any type of node out of service and brings it back in. Uh, there are global maintenance locks using Rados locks before progressing, which is just a primitive concurrency control mechanism that leverages the target cluster. This just allows us to make sure that no two operators are going to try to run different playbooks on the same cluster. We also have Slack utilities that can let interested parties know when things are happening as they happen. And there, of course, ties into our secret storage in order to push and create new key rings, deploy them as necessary. A uh, quick note about the automation is it, of course, thrives on consistency. Snowflakes are inherently inconsistent, and unfortunately, some winters bring more snow than others. When doing operations, try to think about how a change in one cluster today might affect your assumptions tomorrow across a fleet. Some ways your cluster might end up being different from others are even nodes within a cluster might differ. Uh, hardware configs are the easiest deviation, especially as drives tend to go end of life and you mix in the next generation. Centralized config can change between the clusters and you might also forget about that one single OSD that was given a specific config option and might just cause confusion down the road. There might be a long running script in the background that you completely forgot about, and now both you and the balancer are totally confused. Um, definitely had that happened. <laughs> Highly recommend melting your snowflakes so they're all kind of part of the same puddle. Um, glossing over that we build our own Ceph packages, uh, we want to move on to deploying a cluster. And ideally, this is as simple as firing off a playbook and just waiting until it succeeds or it fails. Uh, Realistically, it is generally that easy, but there's a ton of work that goes into these playbooks, and some of this is worth calling out explicitly. Um, first off, we make sure that Chef converges on a host. Uh, that's just kind of our base entry point, and then we start getting into the meat, which I'm just going to skim through here. Uh, there are some safety checks along the way, such as ensuring that uh, all the drives have the same size for a host. Uh, we then create system D units for daemons, configure manager modules, and more throughout this process. Um, the next is easier said than done, but we do the standard dance of creating a mon map, deploy the mons, uh, ensure quorum, that sort of thing. Then we want to create our OSDs and pre-populate the crush tree ahead of time. This is super simple for us because we have an Ansible inventory. 
these Ansible inventory was generated for us using some other VO ecosystem. And it has some specific attributes about placement, such as the rack, number of disks, whether it's an index or a data node, that sort of thing. Um, next up, we deploy the OSD containers and start them across the entire cluster. This is also very simple because we just enumerate the disks on the host and we have a tool that wraps self def volume LVM. Uh, because the crush tree was pre-populated, this can be done in parallel across the cluster, which makes it very quick for us. Uh, finally, we do quick verification that all the OSDs we expected to create were created and started. We also check the cluster health at this point and verify the cluster is healthy and is as bored as it ever will be. In the future, we'd like to fire off this playbook automatically after generating the inventory from completed tickets during our handoff. This is an example of promoting an automation to a service, though it's effectively just orchestrating playbook launches. One of the biggest post-deployment operations we have is capacity augment. Uh, this is where block and object vary, vary um, slightly. Deploying uh, the OSDs and the containers are the same, but giving them PGs is different. On block side, we use Archimedes, which is open source, to slowly upweight OSDs over time. This is mostly done to mitigate peering latency, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a moment. Uh, object uses PG remapper, which is also open source, and it cancels backfill via upmaps. We then slowly undo them in a loop, which brings the PGs back to these new OSDs. This is done because traditionally object had slower uh, hardware where flapping OSDs were not uncommon. The recovery weight from those flaps would get put off by ongoing backfill and eventually turn into backfill weight. This just kind of snowballed into never ending tears. We mostly use PG remapper for uh, an object now to maximize backfill concurrency and minimize degradation. It's possible now that we could make use of the upmap balancer for both products after we cancel backfill. The balancer would then start opportunistically removing upmaps that aren't needed and it could be turned off if necessary. So now that we've got a cluster released to the world and it's no longer bored, we want to keep this thing up to date, handle failure modes, do so all sorts of maintenance. So uh, some planned operations such as uh, cluster augments and capacity management requires as discussed. Um, OSD restarts often either due to updating Ceph, disk failures, or simple flapping if we've got a case of the slows, uh, node reboots to keep a kernel up to date, or nodes either failing due to bad RAM, anything in the network stack, solar flares, you name it. Uh, all of these things will cause PGs to start peering. During peering, no I.O. can happen on these PGs. Um, while peering is very, very quick on our block cluster, it's never going to be faster than our P99 read. Uh, this, is, this can cause some cascading issues to our most, set, our most latency sensitive customers. This is less important on the object clusters because there's the HTTP, HTTP overhead and that latency is usually longer than PG's take to peer. Uh, to give a bit of an idea, this is a P99 read latency graph and those spikes there you might be able to tell were OSD restarts. And it's important to note here that we measure this from inside the cluster against a real RBD image. This means we don't have all the overhead of the network between a droplet and a cluster. We also specifically measure IO latency with this tool. That is, it's a tool to do nothing else like application logic. So some latency sensitive applications with high transaction rates might feel these OSD restarts more than most applications. So what can we do about this latency? Uh, we can reduce the Paxos proposed interval from its default of two seconds to a quarter second as suggested by Sage on the mailing list. However, we actually observed that this made things a little bit worse for us. So we tried another approach. We could try starting all the OSDs without letting their PGs actually peer by setting no up. Uh, we can also check the admin socket on the OSDs for their current status and wait for them to just kind of hang out at uh, preboot state. And once all the OSDs for a host are at preboot, we can then unset no up, allowing PGs to begin peering, which reduces the OSD map updates. Now we get to deal with the recovery overhead on the cluster for a bit, but that's still better than peering for us. We know that we'll never be able to eliminate peering latency in an immediately consistent storage system. However, if we can make some progress in minimizing it, it really helps those applications that are the most sensitive to latency. So look at this graph. Uh, I zoomed in way further on this one to reduce the, no reduce the noise and show the difference. Uh, when combining both the no-up and the Paxos proposed interval set to Sage's recommendation, 
we see great improvement to latency during period. So that's blocks. What about tricks and objects? We have clusters with billions and billions of objects. I can't share the numbers, but it's nuts. Uh, the RGW index layer doesn't handle it very well when we have buckets with way beyond the 100,000 objects per shard rule of thumb. Uh, there are too many shards that will heavily uh, impact list performance. This was a huge problem before we could do any kind of dynamic resharding back in the Luminous days, but even after resharding, what about cleaning up the old shards? Those old shards still have a ton of OMAP data that must be recovered or backfilled to other OSDs from prior. Uh, flapping index OSDs before async recovery meant that we were often better off recreating an OSD if it flapped, which is of course dangerous. A RocksDB compaction, whether full or incremental, could cause any sorts of timeouts, which would cause the OSD to flap after a ton of blocked I.O., which of course hurt availability. So a super quick whirlwind RocksDB primer that glosses over just about everything. Um, it's this log structured merge tree, which is append only, which means that every new entry in the database is, of course, a new write, but that also means that deletes are new writes that we call tombstones. A process to remove the deleted data is needed, this rocks to be compaction. It must either read the full database or ranges of it to compact. This is a lot of time spent in rocks to be code that isn't spent serving customer traffic. Data is stored in different levels from L0 and on. Um, L1 and on are get exponentially larger, and we've spilled into level five, which is kind of terrifying. Um, it's important to note here that we aren't pointing the finger at either RGW's interaction with RocksDB or RocksDB itself. However, we have observed a rough BlueFS interaction with uh, RocksDB when iterating over large amounts of tombstones. This is largely improved today because the Ceph devs and the community are awesome, and the scale at which we're at is not what RGW defaults are tailored for, though it has proven quite capable of handling our scale when tuned. So we need to dig into the index compactions to figure out what was up. In RocksDB, there are files which won't compact until the level is full. This meant there was no upper bound on the tombstone lifetime, leading to slow iterations. We explored a lot, lot of RocksDB options looking for silver bullets, and this effort started back when we were on Luminous. I'll stress that I've condensed many months of effort that most of our teams put all into a single bullet on this slide. There was a ton of discovery and testing throughout. With Nautilus, RocksDB was upgraded, and we had more options to explore. So our silver bullet. We discovered that newer RocksDB gave us access to TTL compaction. When stale data reaches a certain age, a compaction is triggered on the file within RocksDB. This means that the first TTL compaction run on an OSD that hadn't had uh, full compaction in a long time took quite some time, but for us it was uneventful. During this time, we disabled GC and LC, which is helpful here because they are index heavy workloads. The load on our index nodes is consistently higher than it was previously, and for us this trade-off is absolutely worth it. The higher load isn't worrying for us at all, there's plenty of headroom for us, and the nodes aren't boring. The index utilization and capacity sense has dropped a staggering amount. From, uh, some OSDs freed up double digit percentages of their capacity use. Um, we have since disabled periodic compaction in favor of TTL compactions, and this has been our biggest silver bullet for index stability. We have no reason to believe that this will backfire on us today. Um, hopefully next year we won't be here telling you that we were wrong, but these slides are a couple months old at this point, so I think we're good, hopefully. Um, finally, we want to make sure that all the clusters are doing what we expect. Uh, first, similar to uh, Ceph ADM, the Manager Prometheus module was not available when we started, so we wrote in open source the Ceph Exporter. Ceph Exporter is written in Go and doesn't rely on the manager, which has had some scaling issues in the past, but otherwise it accomplishes the same thing. Uh, keep an eye on the fill rates and projections for capacity. Uh, this is especially important today as uh, supply chain issues make lead times absolutely terrifying. Um, this is different than having a finger on the pulse of what capacity is at today. We want to understand weekly, monthly, and even yearly trends. We wrote a tool called uh, Store Exporter, which runs on each host and talks to all the admin sockets for a ton of extra insights. Uh, this can also check hardware on a host, such as reading smart info, get, uh, reallocate sector count, power on hours, et cetera. These are useful metrics to help identify if that drive is headed towards failure. We'll start to get an idea for how many writes a drive can take over its lifetime, how long that lifetime might be. Uh, we also monitor network reachability to every other host using FPing with an expected MTU and don't fragment flags. Uh, if this is ever flaky, we might have gray failures on a single link in a cluster, which in a distributed system can cause an entire world of confusion. 
Network monitoring for these sorts of things can be tricky, but identifying a single network cable that's failed in some way can save you from digging into unrelated areas of your stack that haven't failed in any way. We also have a tool called Merigraph, which is how we measure the cluster latency measure, uh, mentioned earlier. It's a very useful observability tool to get a client-side perspective of what's going on. And with all things monitoring, you should only alert on things that you can take action on. Informative alerting is not actionable, and that's what our graphs are for. Uh, something we're still working on is looking at using Prometheus and Alert Manager's inhibit rules so that in the example of network problems, only the network alert would fire before a slew of other alerts that were firing because of that core network problem. So closing up, let's uh, take a quick look at how we do things differently. In hindsight, we spent a lot of time with division between the block and object teams. They used to be separate pillars under storage. Uh, this meant that we treated our clusters very differently. Automation configuration largely diverged, creating a lot of confusion and duplicate work. Throughout the life cycle of the cluster, there were multiple sources of truth for different things where Chef and Ansible can get their information from. If that were minimized, it would reduce a lot of confusion. The use of the centralized comp instead of scattered Ceph comp files, for example, has been great. Uh, we have a lot of automation, and some of it gets pretty complicated now. Uh, some of that might be better off as services, and just like determining whether something is automating, that line to promote automation to services and finding the right or finding the time to be able to do it is challenging. Um, melt all your snowflakes. A unique cluster is going to become a problem somehow, someday. If all the snowflakes melt together, they become part of the same digital ocean. <laughs> so thank you. That's uh, about wraps it up. Quick hiring plug, uh, check out our careers page, and if we have some time here, I can try to take some questions. First off, I want to say thank you, Matt, for presenting. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we got some questions coming in from chat. Yeah, so is Store Exporter open source? Unfortunately, it is not. It is something that we've kind of talked about back and forth, but we haven't, there, there hasn't been an effort to actually look at open sourcing it yet. Um, I think we have to look at what it's including uh, before we can look at that. Uh, do we balance primary PGs? Uh, balance in what way? Yes, so we do use separate clusters per service, um, per product, rather. So we have clusters for object and we have clusters for block. Uh, this was, I think it was originally because they ran on separate generations of hardware. Um, way back, way back in the day, uh, we envisioned um, object as being used for a very different use case other than what turned out to be web assets. We were expecting large objects at the time. Um, so we geared our deployments for large objects where all of the uh, block deployments were de deployed expecting all well, block workloads. Um, so our, our, our newer generation clusters are, are much, much more tuned to uh, widely, widely varied uh, workloads on object. Um, so balancing primary PGs evenly over all the OSDs, yes, we uh, we do use the OpMap balancer today on the clusters. Um, PG Remapper has been useful for for kind of circumventing that for other maintenance operations, like if we need to drain an OSD um, or just to cancel ongoing remapped backfill for any reason. And any other questions while well, we have Matt here? Lots of wisdom here. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Matt, for taking the time uh, to present.